Hey, it's Camo with the National Access Facebook Show, presented by Solus North Gulch Apartments, where taste matters. Quit waving to the camera. <laughs> Sorry. This is Zoe, and she is our UK correspondent for the National Access Facebook Show. Uh, she's also a pretty talented singer and songwriter, too. Uh, but she's here co-hosting the show today because she's going back to the UK. And to send you off, we've brought in a great guest. I'm really looking forward to today, and so should you guys. His yeah. name is Lane Martin Jr. He's in the Country Music Hall of Fame, or not the Country Music, the, the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Mind blank. Uh, or something else. Uh, and he's got a book out that I think you're really going to enjoy. He's written a ton of big songs that you'll know. Mm -hmm. We're going to bring him in. Come on in, Lane. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for being on the show today. Well, I love it. Let's go sit down and talk. Let's find out a little bit more about you and your book. All right. So, uh, you've written a song or two. Yes, I love writing songs. I'm <laughs> thankful that the one sure ticket to freedom, if you can ever have a life writing song, you yeah, can you actually did. be at your kid's school occasionally. And, and you were writing songs where you actually got paid to write yeah, songs. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, we are sometimes called the golden generation. These people that are my age, yeah. that, you know, there's the greatest generation on the. And what, I never kids? knew what we were, but, but, <laughs> but some people say, and we were very lucky. So what are some of the songs you've had that people will know right off the top? Well, the first song I had that earned a living for me was a song called Rub It In that became a TV commercial called Plug It In, Plug It In, Plug It In. Wouldn't have been over there probably. Gigi Shepard had that. Well, it was called Billy Crash Oh, Billy Crash Crash. And so that enabled me to actually say that I was a songwriter. And then the next one that of more note was a song called Way Down by Elvis Presley that happened to be out. It was the last new song he ever recorded. It was so, I had sent him so many songs, Cam. It's crazy. And the last time on the last day that he ever made a record, the last song was my song Way Down. Wow. It was a total miracle. It must have been oh, it's just mind boggling. I mean because wow. I I'd grown up idolizing him, you know, and uh, imitating him. I have a <laughs> thing of being imitated. Really? Wow. Yeah. I have wow. A, and, uh, you know, it's like 18 or something. And so the idea that this guy ever, and sometimes I see the lead sheet with his name and my name anywhere near his name, and I think, that's impossible. That's not real. Yeah. 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 That's okay. How cool was it when you first, you, you were first told, well, yeah, the king's going to cut your Yeah. Record. You know, I first heard that he was probably going to do it, and then didn't hear anything for months, months. Heard again that he was looking for songs, so I took it back. And the, the secretary of the place I took it called me and said, I think he's done this song already. And I said, that's impossible, I wouldn't know. And I said, no, I'll check, he maybe did. And she called back and she said, yeah, you know, like October 30 or whatever, uh, in the jungle room, he recorded your song. And of course, I got in my tragic little car, which had like minutes to live, but it made it home. So I could tell my wife that he had recorded my song. And so it was a call. That's the kind of thing that you don't care if you make one cent. It's just so magical yeah. that something like that could happen. What do you, I mean, aside from saying thank you, thank you very much. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, or has left the building or one of those things. Yeah. Lying has left the building. Yeah, right. Wow. Um, so, you had a really stellar career as a writer, made a good living at that, and uh, now you've written a book. And I love my book, Cameron. I'm so I'm glad you mentioned gonna it. I'm going to hold this up. <laughs> it's it's called book. Permission to Fly, and uh, it's a memoir of love, crushing loss, and triumph. So give us a setup for for. Sure. The book is called Permission to Fly because that is what my mom gave me very early on. Um, she set me and my rampant curiosity loose to explore, make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And when I made mistakes, got in trouble, she did not rescue me. Instead, she convinced me that I could rescue myself. Mm -hmm. And I fell for that. So uh, this assurance that I was okay on my own just turned out to be the key to everything. And what I felt was a wonderful life. But it started with... Um, you know, don't tell me if you're running into trouble, you know, if you're, you know, 
being assassinated or something, you can call me, but otherwise, <laughs> if you're on your own. And, and it was, you know, really young, like eight, nine, to, wandering around in a little rural neighborhood in Connecticut. Uh, you know, my bike getting flat tires, falling off of it, you know, falling in streams and rivers and stuff, and just dealing with it. Yeah, dealing with it. And it, we've tried to do that with our kids. We have three boys. They're all very self sufficient, too, because we sort of <laughs> passed on the same message to them. That's a great message. Now, what inspired you to write the book? Well, about 25 years ago, 26. My mom, my wife rather, who is just, we've been married for 54 years. She was crippled in a car accident, just like that. Wow. So she doesn't move from here down or feel from here down. So it's completely like, you know. yeah. And 10 years ago or so, I wrote a story for the New York Times about what our life has been like since her car accident. And it just drew this enormous response from around the world. I mean, from from everywhere. And I felt as though I had made contact with families and kind of love-based people, and it just felt so good. So I just kept writing with no real idea it would turn into a book, but I really, for 10 years, that's all I did. I stopped writing songs. I really, this thing kind of just took me over. and. I went into coffee shops every morning about 7 or 10 after 7 and I'm surrounded by these fabulous young kids with all their hopes and dreams and excitement and motivation and kindness to each other. That's the biggest thing I noticed. They're so kind to each other. And I just kept writing and scraping away the stuff that I was tired of or didn't like or didn't wear well. And it just ended up in this book that I, I'm just crazy about it because I feel it's honoring all the people who kind of steered me right in the world, you know, starting with my mom, but then teachers and, you know, coaches and different jobs that I had. Um, but we, I mean, we were bankrupt. We, I, I tried to find something that would earn money while I wrote songs. I landed on this incredibly stupid thing, which was a food, fast food franchise, which I was so ill-equipped to operate. I had 25 employees who hated my guts, and they were right. I didn't know what I, what I was doing, yeah. Uh, but we lost everything because of that. We lost our house and everything. And uh, we were allowed to keep $1,250 worth of property in the 70s. And uh, we started over, and I was a teamster in Nashville here. I loaded trucks. and painted radiators and did anything because we had two, eventually three little kids. And I was just obsessed with it. And some nights, I mean, loading these trucks, this will sound, you'll know what I mean. I thought, if I have a hit record, then I'll have everything because I have these little kids, I have this wife that I'm crazy about. So I wonder if it's possible that I could ever have a hit record because that would really close the gap, you know. And somehow Billy Crash kind of recorded my song and all of a sudden I really was able to go to the Little League games and go to the teachers' conferences and go to the things that happened at the school and, and my wife and I could have lunch together and it was all, it was just a miracle. So, um, yeah, and you know, I, God, I just felt growing up that all these people around me that were super educated, lovely people and everything, but nobody looked free. Mm -hmm. And at school we would be going, yeah, I live in the land of the free. And I, it was just a contrast. I thought, nobody looks free, mm -hmm. even though I know they are. But they didn't look at their days seemed to be yeah, spoken be. for before they even got up in the morning. So I just uh, wanted to have more of a say in what happened during the day. And songwriting provided that for sure. Wow. That, that's that's powerful. You, you're a writer as well, and so you know, and your background is completely different. Totally different. Like, I've had film, um, I've done soundtracks for films and things like that now, but nothing where somebody's taken it on quite like that. Not, not yet, anyway. Just hearing you talk about it. You're <laughs> destined, buddy. <laughs> just hearing you talk about it like that, though, it's such, I mean, just the life you've had and the things that you've done and, you know, the people that you've been able to connect with because of music and because of what you do. It's inspiring. Well, it's so you. inspiring. As a songwriter myself, I'm just I'm sitting here in total awe. Not saying You're, much. Well, I'll tell you a real piece of irony. When when in New England where we lived, it was very rural. I mean, after the Second World War, when people were getting 
get money again, you know? This very rural neighborhood began to be populated by really wealthy people from New York City who found an hour from the city this peaceful spot. So they began buying weekend houses and summer houses and stuff all around us. And they all wanted someone else to mow their lawn, wash their car, clean the swimming pool. So I started knocking on doors. And one of the doors I knocked on was that of Benny Goodman, the famous clarinetist. So, so I, I didn't know them. Nobody knew them. You know, I knocked on the door. Mrs. Goodman, who I didn't know, came to the door. And I said, you know, could I interest you in uh, somebody to mow your lawn this summer? She said, well, how old are you? you know, I said, well, 13. She said, well, maybe, come on in. You know, and we went in and we talked. And, and she said, well, how much are you gonna charge me? And I said, well, I, I need to see the rest of your lawn. And so we went out and it was like lawn, stone wall, lawn, stone wall. <laughs> not, not really gigantic, it's just pretty. Yeah. You know, flowers and the walls. And, um, I, I loved her. She said, tell me something about yourself. And I told my wife, I, said, I wanted to tell her everything there was because she was one of those people, you know. Yeah. But, you know, they had a swimming pool and they, they had a house the size they needed. Yeah. They, it wasn't massive. It was, today it would be called just like mid-normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was beautiful and it housed the number of people they had. And, um, but I became his pool boy, his lawn boy, his everything. I mean, he would call, he, they had daughters, no sons. So sometimes he would call me for special stuff. Like one night he calls up and he says, hey Lang, I just got a movie of my life story in the mail. Will you come over and watch it with me? I go, oh God, <laughs> no, I'm not coming over there. You know? Actually, I need yeah, to change yeah, the really, schedule. Really. Like, yeah, you know, exactly. so, and he, but, uh, so because I did, only had daughters and no boys, and he would, you know, I drove him to concerts later on when I was growing up and stuff. And, um, I mean, he would get out of a concert where people, you know, beautifully dressed women are standing on chairs and stuff and screaming and stuff, and it, that's just incredible, you know. He would get in the car, usually in his convertible, and we'd drive through often a field, you know, where the tent had been for the show. And he would lay back and, so, and he'd say, let's get a hot dog somewhere. <laughs> and I'm having a hot dog with Benny Goodman, you know. So, did that give you a really solid foundation as a songwriter where you you understood how artists behaved and what it took to make a great song? Well, honestly, the, this is the crazy part of it. I had no interest, in, I had no thought of writing songs at that point. I mean, I was probably still with Jeff you know, when I was maybe say 17 or something, right. but no thought. I was a lost puppy, no idea. All my friends were business oriented people. And my thing that Benny Goodman gave me was watching him fall asleep in the sun on a Tuesday afternoon while my dad was busting his tube in yeah. New York City, you know? And this was my first awakening that, oh, there are ways of earning a living where you have some freedom and, and breathing room and some times that time that's unspoken for and um, so the, the fact that uh, the fact that he I mean I, I ruined his pool one time I'll just tell you this quick thing that happened he was having this huge pool party people were flying in from all over the country famous people we've been preparing for two weeks to get his freaking place oh, looking right <laughs> And I had the lawn, the garden, the pool deck was swept, everything's perfect. And the last thing to do was to vacuum the swimming pool. So I finish and it looks, you know, worthy of the Beverly Hills yeah. Hotel it's in, until I go back to turn off the vacuum system, <laughs> reverse it, shoot back all oh, the dirt. Oh, no. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Black. Oh, polluted. Oh. And and I had to go tell him. And to make a real long story short, after a few Jesus Christ and what, <laughs> he, said, like, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, you know something, people are going to laugh their asses off when they see this. It's going to be a great party. <laughs> and Linda and I tried to have that much wisdom raising our boys. You know, I didn't need to be told that I was a freaking moron and screwed up his pool. I knew that already. What I needed was what he did, which is, I got to go up upstairs and comb my hair. I'll be back down. Yeah, that, that's, that's beautiful. So, anyway, all these little lessons that, that I, 
I realized as I was working on my book that there, there are little stories, but they all end with these, these great people doing this opposite of what they might have done. Mm -hmm. And you know, my, my teachers who you know were doing terribly something, the, you, you leave the, I'd leave their, in my case, I went to a boarding school, I'd leave their apartment and I'd say, I'm the greatest guy on earth, he just told me so, you know. But he had called me in there because I had really messed up. And so this message that we all need, uh, we don't need to be pointed out that our mistakes, we need yeah. to be encouraged that we can overcome them, they're just a minor blip and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So, so many of these people did that and they're all in the book. And you've taken that, and with what happened with your wife, how did you apply all those kind of practical lessons that you had learned over the years to, to coping with something that happened? That's a really good question, Ken. Well, the first thing is, I am totally bonkers over my wife. Yeah. I mean, since the very first second, it's accelerated from bonkers to whatever <laughs> comes next. I mean, it's never just it keeps happening. So, so when she had this accident, I was on the phone with the doctor, it was the middle of the night. Um, my first question was, can she think? Because I knew if she could think that that was our relationship, I mean, we're just pals. And then if it just required effort, that's nothing. I'd bust my ass and do anything for her, and I knew she would. And so we have just had a fantastic life and gone all over the place and, you know, learned how to get through doors that are too narrow for the wheelchair and all kinds of stuff that you was you wouldn't even you know I mean you know so but this story for the, that I wrote for the New York Times um, was just such an upper for me because I realized how many people there are you know most everybody that's just where love is essential it's the core it, it's what makes you know, the impossible possible. And so with with Linda, the the lessons that I learned from a lot of these people early on was so much that effort, which is free. That's just a key point. Effort is free. You don't have to be a quillionaire to go for a, a walk for 200 blocks in New York City, but we've done it. You're the first guest I've ever had that has used the word quillionaire. Uh, that is such a high number. It's bigger than this room. I guess you people in Connecticut know things like that. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> really super <laughs> annoying. But to, to take that philosophy and apply it to everyday life and conquering all the things you both would have had to conquer, uh, challenging? Well... Yeah, he, you asked a very good question. The thing that was really fascinating about that situation was we had so much will. What, what we just plain didn't know, if we, it was so baffling. I mean, this, you don't understand this. I mean, going to, you know, like the BMI Awards or yeah. something in beautiful clothes and a bowel movement on the way in the car. Yeah. Stuff like this, you know, it, it's, totally handleable, but it's just so new, yeah. and you're just not ready for it. So it was all these, new, the newness that just, and they just kept coming. It's like being under a waterfall with your fingers and it's just turning through, through. and we, we couldn't. But listen, we, we just woke up every, I mean, we would grill our little hamburgers, we'd have a glass of wine, we'd have our coffee together, and we'd say, this, I, I love you, and it's so wonderful to be able to sit here with you. And we just kept going through it. But we could do it together. I think someone who has an awful thing happen and leaves them alone. That's the one. You know? Yeah. Or the person's mind goes and you're still their caregiver. Mm -hmm. That's totally different. Because we, we've always been a great team and we could continue to be and just learn it. And gradually, even though it's very challenging and very tiring at times, uh, we know it now. We're used to. We've seen almost not everything, but almost everything that is going to come. We've seen it already, and um, it's kind of. It's. I won't say it's nothing, but it's. We know it's coming, and we we're ready for it and stuff. I guess it's going through all those firsts, and once you get yes. past all the firsts, yeah, it becomes 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think in a lot of senses, something like what's happened has kind of brought you guys even closer together than anything oh, yeah. probably could for any relationship. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, God, it's just, just there's so incredible. many things that are so yeah. personal, and you, um, there's kind of nothing that that we will talk about. And then, of course, right. we're raising the kids, and the kids see this. You know, mm -hmm. they don't have the idea that oh, you know, mom's always you know, beautiful and in her gowns and this, 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 this. No, it's like nitty gritty. It's like they see us, you know, going up eight stairs because there's a shop that, you know, we want to get an ice cream cone or something. And, you know, in a lot of cities, Boston, old cities, you go up a, a ton of stairs. In yeah. England, I mean, England yeah, birds in England are like this high. <laughs> Just simple stuff like that. But they, see, they saw that, and I absolutely know that they saw that, oh, Busting your ass is, is uh, in the cards for all yeah. of us somewhere along the line, and it's just de rigueur. It's not like you haven't been crapped on by the universe, that you have this terrible sit. It's just hard for everybody in one way or another. And Do you think your marriage got stronger because of this in a weird way? I, I mean, we just were always such pals. I, I, it's just different. We, I, I honestly don't know. I, this will sound dumb, but I, I don't really know that it could have been any stronger. I mean, we were just. She helped me so much. She has incredible judgment. I mean, when I lost everything and we, the business and everything, I mean, I had been in advertising and I, I'd had a good job, now, but I just wanted to be a songwriter. So I said, look, I just really messed this one up, you know. Nashville sort of in my heart, but but I'll go back to Madison Avenue, you know, if you and she said, Oh, Nashville, no choice. And I mean, so we, we were here, and I mean, I mean she was married to like a 30, 32 year old guy that's like his cars are falling apart, and he comes <laughs> home in the middle of the night, and you're all filthy. And, and, apart. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, he's. You know, uh, what? she never said you're a loser or anything. We would literally grow our little hamburgers and our little kids are floating together. around. Yeah, yeah. we just, and she had 25 bucks a week, sounds ridiculous, to, uh, you know, run our family. And she, I mean, it cost 250 to fill a car up yeah. then, so it was 45 years ago. But, um, you know, God, never got, she made these shirts, she put patchwork, you know what that is, yeah. like a patchwork quilt, yeah. across a denim shirt, and people would see me wearing them, and they'd buy and want one, and she made hundreds of them, wow. she sold them, and so, I mean, we're just total teammates. So. When, yes. when did, sorry, go ahead. No, I just admire how beautiful it is. Thank just, you. Well, I mean, you don't see people like that anymore. You don't hear of things like that anymore. It's just, it's so beautiful that you were able to just live a life like that when you were so united. Uh, thank you. Well, you know, it just happens to you. You can't really make it happen. I mean, if you have lucky enough to run into somebody that you're just crazy about through thick and thin, that's kind of a miracle. And believe me, we don't have any idea how it happened. But I did learn quickly to pay attention to her because her judgment was so good <laughs> and everything. I mean. If you're just tuning in, we're talking to a songwriter, author, Lane Martin Jr. about his book, Permission to Fly. Um, I can't wait to read this. Me too. I think uh, you'll like it. Um, you signed it too, thank you. Yeah, I did. Uh, was there any, how, first of all, how long ago was the accident? It was 26 years ago in 93. Wow. So, and things weren't as, most places now are, are much more accessible. Mm -hmm. So when you're telling these stories of having to go up the stairs, that would have been in most cases. Um, because nothing really had ramps. Or yeah, and it, even today, I mean, a lot of um, older places which have like a high charm factor, yeah. you know, you say, I'm going in there, or castles and like what we do, yeah. you know. They, maybe they have ramps now, but when we were there, they didn't. And you just look at 15 steps and you say, that's going to kill me, but I want to get in that castle. <laughs> you know? And yeah. so, you know, it's all, all these, you know. And, and then people help you. I mean, God, you know. When Linda first had her accident, she would have these spasms, and they would fire her out of her wheelchair. Wow. I mean, she'd be going down the sidewalk, and she'd have a spasm, and thorf, oh, no. <laughs> she, she's on the sidewalk. And some guy, or a couple of people, would, would you know, wow. she'd say, could you please pick me up? Um, so, you know, 
Was there ever a time where either one of you thought, I can't do this? No. I mean, we, we thought, we thought, how do we do it? You know, it was overwhelming. We, we wondered if we could cope with it. We never didn't have the desire, but learning to do it was, it was a really challenge. And, and also, if you want to do things, Cameron, like if, you, if you're just content to just sit in your house or something and not go up, but we weren't. I mean, we, we got all over the place, all over the Europe and everywhere. So you didn't okay. see any limits to no, this at all? Didn't. It was just, okay, this is what we want to do. How do we, How do, we do, do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah completely. Yeah. That's a brilliant wow. handbook. I love it. Yeah. Can I ask you a question sure. as far as a songwriter goes yeah. and an author? How did you find the, the difference between going from writing songs to going and writing a book? Well, How was the conversion? Well, well the, the, the biggest and probably most obvious thing is, I mean, you can write, you know, 50 songs a year mm. or whatever. I mean, if you're writing alone, if you're writing with people, maybe even 100. <laughs> but um, the book, this book took me 10 years. I mean, it really did. I mean, I worked on it virtually every day for 10 years. And so that's the biggest difference. Yeah. But you, you also, you can say, you can really search for the word. You don't have to have rhymes. Yeah. You, you can just search for the, and, then, and you, you can, when you're doing something that has no time limit, you can you know, be in your car or something and, and roll that sentence by yourself 900 times until you get, and in this book, I had so many revisions on it, and, you know, over and teeny tweaks that, People couldn't even notice, but with no time limit, and by the time it's finished, I read that book, and there isn't a sentence in that book I would change, which is a miracle. That's so beautiful. Yeah, it's very rare for a creative thing yeah. not to have a second thought, but it's only because I had so many second thoughts <laughs> over the, you know. You got the yeah. final thing down <laughs> there. Oh, yeah. I love this first quote on the back of the book uh, by Anne River Siddons. Uh, she's a best selling author of the novel Peachtree Road. She says, if Lang Martin Jr. was only a pro stylist, he would be outstanding. Add to that a deep core of music, a joyous sense of adventure, and an abiding and healing love for his family, and you have an artist in the truest sense of the word. I love this book. Thank That's you. That's beautiful. Yeah. That was a miracle, because she's one of the people that I, uh, about 30 years ago, I was on a beach in New England, and I was reading one of her books. Yeah. I, I had never, and, and I just said, God, I just read this book. I, said, I loved it. It's fiction. You know, it was just touching to me. These women who hadn't seen each other in eight billion years. <laughs> Having a reunion. I'm like, say quillion well. again. But they like, aged well. really well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, can you but, but, with it, right? Yeah, well, good there. They were southern women. <laughs> ah, that makes but sense. anyway, I mentioned to someone that I loved this book. I said, they threw the grapevines, this incredible grapevine. Someone from Atlanta called me and said, hey, we know her. Do you want to come for a weekend in the mountains of Georgia? And we'll, and yeah, yeah. So we went to this weekend. It was just this original couple who invited us, Ann Riversons and her fabulous husband and us. Right. And we just clicked over the time. So in between these years, which is like 25 years, um, we've kept in sort of vague touch with each other. And Linda had her accident and Ann Rivers called and stuff and I communicated. But on a flyer, when I finished this book, when I had a real copy like this, I FedExed it to her and just said, would you consider a blurb? And, like, and I didn't hear for about a month. And one day I went to the mailbox and it looked like a, like a birthday card or something. It was written by hand. I opened it up and she had that blurb. And I said, this is just insane. I'm jumping up and down in my yard, you know, and everything. And so when she said, I love this book, and that's why I put it on the front, because she's written so many massive hit books and stuff. So. But she mentions your sense of adventure. Well, and... I think to be a songwriter, you have to have a certain sense of that. But it seems like nothing has taken away that sense of adventure for you. Even when we met this morning, I got this sense of, okay, this is what I'm doing today. <laughs> oh, well, it's funny you say that because like, when I was between my freshman and sophomore year in college, I said, I am going to go completely around America. I'm going 7,500 miles or whatever. I'm going to go to the East Coast, the West Coast, and North to the South, hitchhiking. 
My mom, my mom dropped me off at the Merritt Parkway in Connecticut. I had forty-seven bucks. But this is, wait, this is 1962, so that's like seven thousand. It was a thing of Jack Kerouac. Well, I was just yeah. thinking, I want to see the buttes and the cactuses and the deserts, and the, I want to go in the diners and hear the different accents. I want to work on a ranch and make a few bucks yeah. to keep my trip going. I, I want the American experience, you know, which yeah. was so I did, and it was gone for two months. And uh, I mean, it taxed my coping skills. Believe me, I had some terrifying yeah, stuff so about it. So. But, but I mean, what I, I mean, I got in a car one day with seven gypsies, like of every age, <laughs> every age. I mean, like including like pink blanket, six months yeah. or whatever. Um, one old man, and he was assembling people to drive cars from Idaho or somewhere where we were to somewhere, Pendleton, Oregon. Do you drive? He stops on the side of the road and there's eight, eight, seven or eight people in the car, all piled on top of each other, big Cadillac with a slash, broken floor, crack across the windshield, you know, very comforting. You know? And so <laughs> he's, I said, yeah, and he said, so will you drive a car out there, I'll buy all your meals. And I said, yeah. So I get in, I pile on top of this old guy who is right next to this totally adorable gypsy girl who's holding the pink yeah. blanket baby. We go outside town, he stops, and there's like, there's these six cars here, and he says, we need more people. We go downtown in Pocatello, wherever we were, I don't even know the town. On a street corner, he finds these two homeless people, no kidding, they didn't have bags, no bags. They get in the car with us, and there's already now however many in, in there. And, and we drive to these cars, and he gives us each a car. And he says, you, you be last to me. I guess I looked like I, I don't know, like I needed to be last or something. And he says, nobody passes, we stay in line. So we're going across this desert. I mean, we're going 40 miles an hour. I've got Green <laughs> Onions has already played like 35 times, everything. Oh, oh, oh my God, I can't stand it. I had this really <laughs> hot 62 uh, Chevy that was a very fast car. I said, I'm gone. And I hit this thing. I passed these guys. Oh, Pinned the speedometer at 115, no wow. kidding you. Through the desert and then up into this beautiful green pasture, you know, uh, green forest, and I stopped the car by a river, and waited for them. And about a month later, <laughs> these guys come loading up <laughs> like this. I mean, and I've gone with this car. Gypsy guy, the big older guy, gets out and he says, why do you do that? And I said, I had to do it. And he said, don't do that anymore. You know? <laughs> but but he, wow. he kept stopping, I mean, they, you know, starting to get hungry and they pulled into a convenience thing and the woman and the baby, the girl and the baby. And I said, are we having dinner? She said, no, we're getting milk for the baby. Okay, get back in the car. Now I'm really starting. Stops this huge garage that's open and the light is on in there and thing. he pulls in and I get out and I said, what are you doing? And he goes to this mechanic, got the wrench and he says, hear that sound in my car? And the guy says, yeah, I hear that sound. And he said, what is it? And he says, your fan belt's flapping. He said, can you fix it? And he said, yeah, I can fix it, but we just work on trucks here. We don't work on cars. He said, but I need you to fix it. He said, we don't work on cars. The guy pulls out a wad of money, like as big as that bale yeah. of hay. And he starts peeling off. We, we get this, this whatever new fan belt, awesome. and, 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 and we're on our way. But he keeps, and finally, like at 9.30, like I'm ready to eat the dashboard of my car. Oh, man. He stops. And and I said, hey, I, I love you, but I I can't do this anymore. I'll, we'll get to Oregon forever. So he said, I'll still feed you. You can have your lunch, just your dinner. So I walk out, walk across the street, stand at the light tape, and, and here comes the car and the thing, and that beautiful gypsy girl with the baby is driving my car. <laughs> and stuff like that. I don't know. It's great. That's great. What great adventures, though. Yeah, it was great. Incredible. I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. It sounds like yeah. your life truly has been an adventure. 
It has. I love every it single day. And her. I love her. I, she's my newest excitement. I think she's one of the <laughs> brightest <laughs> people I've ever known. No kidding. That's, that's his publicist. That she, blows her no, she's her. got so much spirit. It's just ridiculous. I love it. Yeah, she's great. And, and thank you for bringing him to me. You are welcome. Uh, <laughs> the book is called Permission to Fly, A Memoir of Love, Crushing Loss, and Triumph by Lang Martin Jr., this is Lane Martin. Thank you Jr. so much, Cameron. Thank Get the book. Thank you so book. much. Thank you. Read the book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for Thank you Cameron. What Thank a pleasure. You. Uh, thanks for co-hosting today. Thank and you uh, good luck on, on your venture hosting the show for us in the UK. Yes, it's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you guys stay tuned. Thank you for joining us. Uh, been a blast talking to Lane Martin Jr. Make sure you catch us on the next episode. You can catch me on radio. On I have to always think about this. Hippie Radio 94.5 here in Nashville, Saturdays from 3 to 7, all across the UK on Chris Country, Sundays at midday, and every Thursday morning in Tamworth, Australia with Jody and John at uh, about 9.30 in the morning on Tamworth Radio 88.9. Thanks for watching the show. We'll see you next time.